Hello. Today we're going to show what you can do with just the linear sequence of proteins. We're going to be using two resources. One is called Uniprot. It's a repository of protein sequences. And uh, we'll show you then what you can get with that. And along with that, we'll also be introduced to some of the tools that you can get from the Expassi website, which can tell you some useful things about the protein uh, features as well too. So without further ado, We'll go to the Uniprot site. You just Google Uniprot and click the link, and here you go. So at the very top, you can enter information about uh, the protein that you're looking for. And just like with the PDB, you can search by the uh, Uniprot KB accession number. That's the code that each pro uh, protein sequence would have. Or if you don't know that, you could just uh, start typing in some keywords. What we'll do first is assuming that we have the accession number, so we'll type that in. So P24232. That corresponds to uh, a globin that's produced by E. coli. So in a past lecture we talked about how uh, globin proteins, which we use for oxygen transport, uh, can be used by other organisms as well too to do different things. And this is actually such a protein produced by E. coli, and it uses it to protect itself from the toxic effects of uh, nitric oxide that can be produced uh, either within uh, the, uh, the host that e the E. coli is in, or uh, can sometimes be produced um, non-biologically in its environment. So when we click on that, it shows you at the very top, it shows you the accession number. And when you look here with the status, it says reviewed. There's two types of um, structure uh, sequences in the uh, Uniprot database. There's the reviewed ones, which are indicated by the gold panel with the star there. Uh, that essentially means that they've been extensively reviewed. They've got lots of annotation. Annotation just means what they know about the protein in addition to just the sequence. So uh, the more highly annotated a sequence is, the more information you have about that protein and the more information consequently you'll see on this entry. So at the very top, it actually tells you what the role of this protein is. And if you scroll on down, it provides you more information, shows you what cofactors are bound to it. So it's a flavin cofactor, heme. Uh, because this uh, protein has been characterized, they even have some of the kinetic information about that, and Michaelis constants for the different substrates. And of course, we'll be talking about that sort of thing when we get to the lectures on uh, enzymology, catalysis. Uh, further information when you scroll down, uh, it tells you where those cofactors bind, what parts of the sequence are associated with that, right here. It tells you about its function, the various functions that this can do, uh, keywords that go along with it, and also uh, the name of the protein, preferred names, synonyms for it, and so on. So the more extensive the annotation, the more is known about that sequence, the more this, uh, this site will be filled out. So it even crosslinks it to publications as well, too. So if you want to know a bit more about this, where this information came from, wherever it says publication, you, you just click on that, and that will show you the citation, which you can then look up on uh, PubMed, which will be uh, the topic of another uh, seminar presentation as well, too. So it's extensively cross-listed. You don't just get the sequence here. You also get a lot of information about the protein itself. If we scroll further on down, um, you can do blast searches here to call up uh, protein sequences that might be similar. If the protein structure has been known, that information will be in the site as well too. And first it shows it as a cycle like biograph of the linear sequence of the protein. And it shows the alpha helical regions in blue, the turn regions in pink, and the beta strand regions in, uh, in light green. Now on top of that, if the protein sequence is actually known, uh, this will be cross-referenced to that entry. Now, uh, this database is actually uh, located in Europe, so where you go to is the PDB in Europe if you link on this. So it shows you the PDB entry here. So if you wanted to see what the structure of this protein is, you just click on its uh, PDB ID here. It doesn't take you to the PDB that we've seen before. It takes you to the PDB in Europe. But it's, much, uh, sim it's very similar to the way that the uh, PDB that we've seen before is set up. So if you want to, for example, uh, look at the citations that uh, uh, publish this uh, structure in, uh, they'd be over on the right-hand side, structural analysis, and most importantly for us are the views. So we can actually view this in 3D visualization uh, within the browser, just like we could with the regular PDB. 
So we go over here, it says 3D visualization. It's a different viewer, but it does the same thing. So you click on that, and this window will pop up, a different program. And this actually shows you the structure of uh, the protein. Now, the way it's crystallized, in this case, you can see it's got multiple subunits. Each one of these chains corresponds to uh, the linear sequence of that protein. So the flavohemoglobin in E. coli is actually uh, composed of uh, many uh, identical subunits. So if you're lucky, uh, if you've got a structure, then you can uh, find it actually when you start doing the search just in the sequence through the Uniproc uh, database. So that just shows you what the power of that database is. Uh, and uh, es essentially uh, providing as much information as is available. And it's constantly being updated as well, too. So the main thing for us right now, this is all nice, and you know, it's also, also very neat that you can do these sorts of uh, uh, connections between databases. What we want right now is just the sequence of the protein, because we're going to be using that to do some other stuff as well, too. It's usually located near the bottom of the page, and so we've got it right here at sequence. Uh, there's two formats. There's this format we've got... Um, every 10 residues and then a space and every 10 it shows you exactly where you are because the numbers are above here. Uh, but for our purposes, when we want to, we want to manipulate this structure, manipulate the sequence, sorry, uh, we want to change the format. So we click on this uh, link that says fast A, and that will just change the format. So this is called fast A format right here. We now we just have the continuous string of amino acid residues. Now we can select that and we can just copy it. And now we can take that and we can go to a different site. We can find information about the sequence um, just by pasting that in. So where we're going to go to now is going to open a new window. And we're going to type in as a Google search term, Expasi. And what you can also type in is that prop param. Expasi has lots and lots of uh, utilities that you can use for um, looking at sequences and comparing sequences, etc. But the first one to use is actually uh, the very basic one. It's called protein parameter. So we just click on that. It will take us to the protein parameter tool. And what we can do then is we can paste that sequence that we copied in. And now this will just compute some very basic parameters for this protein for us. So we just click on the button. And now it shows us the sequence, just to make sure we got the sequence right. Now it tells us things like the number of amino acid residues. It calculates the molecular weight for us. We can see it's about 44,000. Uh, here's a really interesting thing, an important thing. It can calculate the uh, theoretical isoelectric point of the protein for us. So um, what it does is it looks at all the um, acidic and basic side chains that are present in the protein, and it can calculate based upon that content what the isoelectric point of the protein is. And so the isoelectric point, or PI, uh, that's the uh, pH at which the protein has no net charge. So if you put that protein into a buffer that has a uh, pH that's above that uh, PI, it's going to have a net negative charge. And if you put it in a buffer that's below this uh, pH, it's going to have a net positive charge. So it's actually very useful then for determining, uh, say, conditions under which you want to purify the protein, because one of the ways you do this would be, say, by ion exchange chromatography, where proteins being ions will bind to a particular chromatography resin, and you can determine what the charge state will be in the protein, and then select the resin you want to use to accomplish that, uh, that purification. Now, uh, the protein parameter tool also calculates the um, percent amino acid content of the proteins for you. So you know, you can see here that uh, alanine constitutes almost 11% of the protein sequence. And uh, this can be important uh, when you want to, say, determine if the protein is going to absorb in the UV region or not, because that's determined by the number of amino acids that are aromatic. And so many tryptophan. Tryptophan absorbs in the ultraviolet region, and if you wanted to detect this protein uh, in the UV region, uh, you could do that if it's got tryptophan residues. And you can see right there that, yes, it does. So then you could detect this protein by such a uh, technique. It also tells you the number of uh, acidic residues, negatively charged residues right here. Likewise, the positively charged residues, the strongly basic residues like arginine and lysine. So it tells you how many of each of these you have. Um, if you care to have it, this is the atomic formula of a uh, protein. And you can see that it just brings home the fact that proteins are quite, quite large molecules. Um, extinction coefficients, you know, if you're going to look at the absorbance in the ultraviolet region, 
Uh, this is essentially based on the sum of the uh, tryptophan content. So it tells you what the extinction coefficient is, also called the molar absorptivity coefficient. And if you're trying to express this protein uh, recombinantly, it tells you basically how long this protein could last in uh, an organism. This is just an estimate, but it can give you an idea if the, if the consider the protein to be stable or not. Okay, so all of that was done uh, if we knew what the uh, uh, unipro ID number was for a protein. But what do you do if you don't have such a number? Well, you can go back to the, uh, the top window here, and you can type in search terms. So in our case, I want to look at uh, flavohemoglobin, say, from a different species. So you could just type in flavohemoglobin. And we'll go with one that we actually work on in our laboratory, which is from the uh, intestinal parasite Giardia. So we hit return. And now we see we have a limited subset of structures. Uh, there's four of them. They're probably all identical because they're all from different strains of uh, the same uh, species. Uh, but you could then do this the same way. If you just click on one entry, you get more information on it. You can scroll down. Uh, you can see that there's two papers published on it. And hey, look at that. One of that is from our laboratory, so good for Trent. We can do some stuff here. Um, and so on. And as much information is available for this protein, uh, you would find it here. So the Uniprot uh, site is actually a great go-to site, not just for this course, but in future courses, if you're working on a particular protein and you want to know more about it, it's a great place to go to to find out um, what's known about it and papers that you can get on it that are key for its structure, for its properties, and things like that. So it's a very, very useful uh, resource, uh, well outside the, uh, the bounds of just this course. You know, the sky's the limit with this. Uh, so there will be, uh, accompanying this, there will be some uh, searching uh, exercises for you to do uh, with different proteins just to show how you can use this thing. So uh, thank you very much and uh, hope you find this uh, useful in the future. Hello again. There's a couple of extra things to talk about here uh, at the end of this uh, tutorial. Uh, one is uh, a little bit of a shortcut. So when you get to the protein parameter tool, you could paste the amino, amino acid sequence in here uh, like I did it in the previous uh, presentation. Alternatively, if you have the um, ID number, the Unipro ID number. You can enter it in as well too. And that will give you then uh, the same information. Now sometimes the protein will be uh, post-translationally processed. What that means is that uh, the sequence as you get just from translation of the, uh, the gene uh, is not the mature uh, protein. So the mature protein will be a little bit shorter. So we'll see that when we compute the parameters here. The full length protein would be from residues 1 uh, to 401, but the mature protein is actually going to be smaller than that. So this particular sequence, so this protein called renin, uh, it gets processed so the first uh, 64 residues, uh, first 63 residues are discarded, and the remainder is split into two uh, shorter uh, polypeptide sequences. So residues 64 to 351 make the heavy chain, and residues 354 to 401 make the light change. So you could search the parameters for each of these uh, uh, for, uh, pe uh, peptides separately. So if you wanted to do, say, just the heavy chain, you would just click on that right there where it's in bold. And alternatively, if you just wanted to do the light chain, you would click on that down there, and that would figure out the parameters uh, for you. So if you're uh, doing the uh, tutorial exercises and you get this sort of issue here, then it's up to you which one you choose. Uh, typically, the ones that are most important are the ones that are in bold. So you could do any one of those and just, you know, note uh, what uh, sequence you uh, you use for that. So, for example, if we wanted to look at the structure, say, for the renin-2 heavy chain, we just click on that up there, and that's residue 64 to 351 is what corresponds to here now. So that shows that going from 64 to 351 and then it will give you all those parameters just for that uh, polypeptide. If you did the same thing for the light chain, you just went backwards, you did it for the light chain, you would get a different set of information because now you're working with a different polypeptide chain. Uh, and then with those two things, you can get a complete idea of what the uh, mature protein is uh, like. So this is a, just a little bit of uh, extra information because when you do these sort of exercises, uh, you will encounter this uh, at some point or another one.